Amen. Well, as we continue under this heading of belonging, one of the things that we like to do before we dismiss the kiddos for Sunday school um, is we like to talk about some of the things happening in the life of our church. And the reason we do this is not just because this is a convenient way to get the announcements across, but because we really believe that when God works in our lives, one of the ways that he works is not just with us individually, but he works with us collectively to build us up together as his church. And that as we sing that God is our living hope, you know, we sing that together because that hope is made real by one another. And one of the ways that we also talk about this is we love to hear about the stories of grace that have worked in our lives together. And so to share with us this morning, I'd like to invite up Brandon Lynn um, to speak and Make your way up. Yes, you can applaud for it. Yes. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> well, the church leadership um, reached out and asked me to share with you this morning about my decision to run for elected office and how it intersected with my faith. For those of you who didn't know, three months before the November 2022 election, I decided to run for mayor of Irvine. Now, you're, if you're sitting there wondering, run for mayor? I totally, completely get it. My parents thought the same thing. Starting in 2017, I developed a rare and unusual passion, one that I never would have seen for myself as a music major in college who ended up working 20 plus years as a litigation paralegal. I developed a passion for local government here in Irvine, my hometown, because if you can affect change anywhere, it's here at home, right? Anybody familiar with the sitcom Parks and Recreation? Leslie Nope, I totally get her. This newfound passion led me to co-found a nonprofit called Irvine Watchdog, seeking the principles of transparency, honesty, and accountability in our local government. A group of residents and I wanted to fill the void that our local papers had left due to the decline in journalists at City Hall. And to compound that void, at any given city council meeting, out of the 320 thousand plus residents we have now in Irvine, guess how many attend? On average, maybe five to 20 people watch more than half the meeting. And that's it. As they say, democracy dies in darkness. So out of obligation and civic duty, I decided to watch nearly every city council meeting since 2018 and try to report on important issues over the years to empower and inform Irvine residents. Well, fast forward to 2020, 22. My family and I were on vacation and I was watching the city council meeting from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico with a cocktail in hand because who doesn't? That night, our mayor voted against something that I felt was a much needed change to increase representation for our ever growing city. This was just another issue added to the list of others that resulted in much consternation over the years. I kept saying to my husband, somebody who knows the issues needs to run for mayor. Well, with only three months before the election, maybe it was the drink my husband had, but after much deliberation, he gave me the green light to run, but only this one time. Immediately, I began to plan my next steps. I thought, okay, how am I gonna tell my employer that I need to take time off to run for office? Where am I gonna find a campaign treasurer? What do I do? My brain went into a brainstorming frenzy. Well, out of the blue, the next morning, while we were walking to breakfast at our hotel, lo and behold, I received an email from my employer. The firm decided to let me go. I later found out my team was planning on leaving the firm anyway, but I took this opportunity as a sign, supporting my decision to run, and it was full steam ahead. Having only three months until the election, my run for office became a sprint, and it was abundantly clear God had, was my provider and sustainer the entire time because I had a load of passion with no plan. As a Christian, the principles of transparency and accountability and concepts like walking in the light versus walking in darkness are familiar ones. And we have the greatest example of a true leader, Jesus Christ, the servant king, who did not come to be served, but to serve. Luke 12, 48 reminds us, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. What more is being asked of me? What more is being asked of you? So many of us have been given so much, but what is God calling us to do with it? 
Well, after three months of sprinting all over this beautiful city, showing up to over 20 neighborhood meet and greets, filling out questionnaires and for local papers and attending debates, I came in second out of five candidates. Now, some of you may be wondering, if God was with you all along, why didn't you win? Jeremiah 29, 11 states, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. The reality is, following Jesus doesn't mean we always succeed at everything we do, always win, always vindicated while here on earth. But there's a greater purpose and an eternal hope he gives, a sustaining hope that enables us to live this life free from the fear of losing, free from the fear of hurtful words, because let's face it, words can really hurt, free from the fear of having mailers circulated citywide with a funny photo of your face, free from the fear of having your motivations and intentions questioned because my identity is in Christ. As the Bible states, the word of God judges the thoughts and motivations of our hearts. He knows the truth of why we do what we do. Colossians 3.31 states, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. As a Christian, we're challenged to do things as recipients of an unconditional love, providing unconditional hope. This hope and this love give us the foundation to serve, to be hurt, to fail, to be wrongly accused, to face injustice, but still continue to persevere for what is good, right, and just until the day we rest. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, when we find security in him, our identity in him, we realize we have the power to be bold in loving others, bold in speaking truth to power, bold in seeking justice, and bold in serving others and our community selflessly as Christ served us, expecting nothing in return. 2 Timothy 1.7 states, For the Spirit of God gave us, not, um, gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Jesus taught us power is, is expressed in how much we can love and serve others, not in terms of how much we can leverage from others. My campaign created a community of great people from both sides of the aisle who were informed on the issues in local government and hopefully saw that there are ways to do politics other than the status quo. Honestly, transparently, while holding ourselves, our words, and our deeds accountable. As Micah 6, 8 states, what does the Lord require of us? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And in 1 John, we're instructed to love not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Whatever is tugging at our hearts this morning, whatever God opens our eyes to, let us all remember as 1 Corinthians states, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone.